In our conversation, our addresses, our preaching activities, we often use the expression, the signs of the times. And as we look around the world today, Bible in hand, we can so very easily see, I think, the outworking of God's purpose. We have to remember that actually faithful men and women of every age have been able to do this. For example, Habakkuk, who probably prophesied during the reign of King Jehoiakim, cried out to God about the terrible state of Judah in his day. And the prophet is told about the imminent Chaldean invasion of the land. But God's answer to Habakkuk, you may recall in Habakkuk chapter 1, began with these words. Behold ye among the nations, and regard, and wonder marvellously. In other words, Habakkuk was told by God to watch the signs of the times. And we have to do the same. And if we do, it will help to strengthen our faith and cause us to wonder marvellously. Well, 2016 was an astonishing year for signs of the times on many fronts. And the same, I think, has been true of this year, 2017. Two of the most significant events over the last two years, certainly from our perspective, living in the UK, and in fact for many people the most surprising, are the referendum results in the UK uh, for Britain to leave the European Union, because that's going to have a profound effect on both Britain and what remains of the EU, and also, of course, the election of Donald Trump to be President of the United States. You may remember he wasn't even expected to win the Republican Party nomination, let alone the presidency. So it really did cause a great deal of astonishment, I think, worldwide. And we have to remember, brothers and sisters, that these events were not chance happenings. The scripture principle is very clear indeed. The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And that's emphasised to King Nebuchadnezzar several times in Daniel chapter 4. It was true then, and it will continue to be true until the kingdom of men is finally replaced by the kingdom of God at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, last year's US presidential election uh, campaign was certainly one of the most riveting and acrimonious of recent times. In fact, uh, on occasions, it was actually bizarre, wasn't it, aspects of the campaign. Opinion polls and the expectations of many were confounded, and political leaders, you may recall, were left scrambling to forge links with the president-elect, as he then was, and his team. And while his supporters were jubilant at the result, others no doubt will have sympathised with the view expressed by France's ambassador to the US, who exclaimed, the world is collapsing. But along with the, the recent vote in the UK to leave the European Union, all of this has the potential seriously to disrupt the status quo and may yet provide momentum for disruptive forces in other countries. And I think we've actually seen evidence of that happening just over the last year. For example, across Europe, with general elections in a number of key states, there was a surge of support for anti-establishment and nationalist parties. And even though these parties turned out to be generally less successful than expected, except, uh, except perhaps in Austria, that they were less successful than expected at the ballot box, they have undoubtedly helped to shape the debate and influence the politics of the mainstream parties. A Stratfor report that was published towards the end of last year made this comment. Win or lose, these parties will continue to challenge the free movement of people, goods, services and capital in the European Union and throw the future of the Eurozone into doubt. Though an electoral victory would speed up these processes for the Eurosceptic parties, their influence will still be felt on the continent long after the 2017 votes have been tallied. Just a few days ago, in a newspaper I picked up while I was en route here, The Straits Times, uh, in a very interesting article actually, entitled, Europe's Populist Deflected Rather Than Defeated, 
the writer said, Europe's problem is not only how to deal with the rise of populists, but also that its entire existing political system is collapsing from within. So make no mistake, we are witnessing a time of crisis. Added to this, of course, the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, earlier this year, on March the 29th, triggered, triggered what was called Article 50, and that's the article that begins the Brexit process, which formally takes Britain out of the European Union exactly two years from when it was triggered, so, so that is March 2019, notwithstanding the fact they're now talking about another two-year transition period. Nonetheless, the process of taking Britain out of the EU is underway. At the end of January this year, Theresa May became the first foreign leader to meet the new US president, just a week, in fact, after Donald Trump's inauguration. And everything about that visit emphasised the closeness between the two countries. At a joint press conference at the White House, the President remarked, great days lie ahead for our two peoples and our two countries. He also said that he thought Brexit would be a wonderful thing for the UK and provide the condition for new trade deals. For her part, Mrs May congratulated the President on uh, his stunning election victory, as she called it, and described her early invitation to Washington as an indication of the strength and importance of the special relationship that exists between our two countries. And just notice this, she said, a relationship based on the bonds of history, of family, kinship and common interests. And that's something that just can't be wiped away. History, family, kinship, and common interests. President Trump was invited unusually early in his term of office to make a state visit to the UK, which has become somewhat controversial, but nonetheless it is expected that he's going to visit the UK sometime in 2018. In addition, although the UK cannot formally negotiate trade deals until it leaves the EU, President Trump declared that he wants a quick deal when the time comes. In a speech to Republicans the day before, Mrs May said that she wished to renew the special relationship between the US and the UK. Indeed, both leaders described the relationship as being very special. Now, obviously, we have to wait and see how this works out in practice. But there's no doubt at all that as far as Britain is concerned, the transatlantic relationship is extremely important. And Britain's former Foreign Secretary, William Hague, in an article at the beginning of this year, put it like this. He said, every day, all over the world, whatever our ambassadors and soldiers are doing, they are usually doing it in concert with our transatlantic cousins. And our business with America, he said, is greater than that with any other single country, even before attempting a special trade deal. The alliance, he said, with the USA is the one relationship the UK has that is truly indispensable. Now, don't be too despondent, because in addition to that, the UK is also seeking to strengthen its ties with the Commonwealth which today, as I put on the screen there, is a group of 52 nations. The, the Queen is actually head of state of 16 of them. Most member states having previously been part of the British Empire, with a combined population of 2.2 billion, covering six continents. It occupies almost a quarter of the Earth's land mass, and its combined GDP is 6.9 trillion pounds. That's just remarkable when you look at the extent of the Commonwealth's reach. Uh, one British newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, reported that on the first Commonwealth Day since the EU referendum, so that was in March this year, Theresa May made it clear that the Commonwealth will play an increasingly important role in Britain's trading fu future with trade between member countries projected to be worth some £820 billion by 2020. 
Britain's Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson has said the Commonwealth and the EU are level pegging in their gross domestic product, with the Commonwealth growing far faster. Leaving the EU, he said, would enable Britain to do deals with Commonwealth countries that until now have been dictated by EU trade agreements. So for those who are very keen on the Brexit process, the possibilities then, particularly for trade, are very appealing. But this relationship that Britain has with its Commonwealth was certainly damaged when, some years ago, Britain joined the European Club. And you might find this comment interesting, which was made by the Australian High Commissioner to the UK, Alexander Downer, in a newspaper article at the end of last year. He wrote of the sadness that was felt when Britain deserted, as he said, those Commonwealth countries which had stood by her in her darkest hour. In two world wars, he said, New Zealand, Australia and Canada, with India, South Africa and other members of the then empire, sent thousands upon thousands of troops, airmen and sailors to help save Britain. Despite this sacrifice, he said, the attitude of the Heath government, that was Edward Heath, who was Prime Minister in the early 1970s, the attitude of the Heath government in the 70s was, so what? Government is about the national interest, not emotion. Britain had to make its future in Europe, and we could make our futures somewhere else. So, you know, when Britain really downplayed its relationship with the Commonwealth and decided to join the European Club in the early 1970s, as the Australian High Commissioner said, it caused a good deal of sadness amongst its traditional friends. But this wasn't the attitude of British politicians in the years immediately following the Second World War. I just thought it might be useful to do a little bit of a survey through the years to see how Britain ended up in the European club, as it were. In 1946, the empire was still intact, and Britain still had a worldwide military presence, with troops in Germany, Greece, India, Egypt, Palestine, Iran, Singapore, and Malaya. However, for a country exhausted by the Second World War, this proved to be too expensive to maintain. And in the years following, most of the empire gained independence, beginning with India in 1947. The majority of the newly independent states, however, decided to remain within the Commonwealth. Britain continued to play a world role, even though she was no longer the great power she had been. Britain's humiliation in the Suez Crisis of 1956 demonstrated her difficulty in following an independent foreign policy any longer without the approval of the United States. Dean Acheson, who'd been U US Secretary of State under President Truman, made his famous comment in a speech in 1962 that Britain has lost an empire and has not yet found a role. Well, in searching for a role, British politicians gradually looked to the emerging beast system of Europe. However, when the European Economic Community, the EEC, as it was then called, was formed in 1957, Britain decided not to become a member. It's often been pointed out that, ironically, it was Churchill in a broadcast during the Second World War who spoke about the need for a Council of Europe. After the war, in September 1946, he delivered a speech at Zurich University in which he advocated a United States of Europe in order for those countries to hold their own in the modern world. He saw Great Britain and its Commonwealth, the USA, and he hoped at that time Soviet Russia, as friends and sponsors of the new Europe, but not as members of it. Churchill didn't imagine that Britain was going to become a member of this European group. He wanted it to be a friend and sponsor. Well, when the Treaty of Rome establishing the European Economic Community, the EEC, was signed on March 25th, 1957, the signatory countries were France, West Germany, Italy, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. So there were six of them. And of course, this has now developed into what is known as the European Union, 
currently comprising 28 countries and incorporating some 510 million people. Now that photograph you can see is of the signing of the treaty in 1957 that established the EEC. 1957. So this year was the 60th anniversary of the signing of that treaty and there were particular celebrations held in Rome on the occasion. European leaders went, they were celebrating, but as the main focus was looking to the future, Britain's Prime Minister didn't attend. Now the interesting thing is, in 1957, following the signing of that treaty, the leaders of the six signatory countries trooped off to see the Pope, Pope Pius XII, the wartime Pope. This year, the EU's heads of government met the Pope the day before the anniversary. But once again, he was there at the heart of this. And there was an article in one of Britain's national papers, the Daily Express at the time, earlier this year, that said this. Now, just listen to this. Brussels chiefs are hoping that the pontiff can provide them with the leadership they are lacking to help solve the debilitating crises tearing the bloc apart. One pro-EU think tank official said that with Barack Obama gone from the White House, the head of the Catholic Church was the only moral authority European politicians had left to follow. Well, how remarkable that is in relation to Bible prophecy. You know, here's another development that fits in with our expectations of the time of the end. A Catholic-dominated European beast system as set out in Revelation chapter 17, from which Britain and her allies will be separate. But we're jumping ahead, back to 1957. In Britain, this new EEC, as it was called, was, was known as the Common Market. The six founding nations were aiming for free competition and a common market. But the treaty also speaks, that Treaty of Rome, also speaks, amongst other things, of working for a closer union of European peoples. So its aim, therefore, was always, from the very beginning, wider than simply a common market. But at this time, even the economic advantages were viewed with some suspicion by the British government. It was felt that Britain would surrender full control of her economy and it would damage her trading relationship with the Commonwealth. So actually, British politicians in the 1950s were wiser than their successors who came later. There was also concern then of damaging Britain's relationship with the USA if economic integration led in time to political integration. But by the early 1960s, all these doubts were put to one side, and uh, the British government under Prime Minister Harold Macmillan announced a desire to join the EEC, only to have negotiations scuppered by France's General de Gaulle, who said no to British membership of the uh, EEC. I, I took French when I was at school. <laughs> and I can well remember that de Gaulle was thought of very badly in my younger days in the UK. Britain wanted to join the EEC, and he refused. Now, Actually, when you look at what de Gaulle had to say all these years on, there is something in what he said. He gave various reasons, such as Britain's economic woes at the time, but some of his objections, as we look back on them now, were clearly quite right. Now, just look at this. This is what de Gaulle said. He said, England is, in effect, insular. She is maritime. She is linked through her interactions, her markets and her supply lines to the most diverse and often the most distant countries, you know, a trading nation. She pursues essentially industrial and commercial activities and only slight agricultural ones. She has in all her doings very marked and very original habits and traditions. See, he recognised in the early 1960s that Britain didn't really belong in the European project, and he vetoed Britain's membership for a second time, in fact, in 1967. However, de Gaulle's successor in France, Georges Pompidou, 
was more sympathetic to Britain's third application for membership, and under Prime Minister Edward Heath, who's pictured there on the screen, Britain joined the common market on January the 1st, 1973, a decision that was then ratified in the referendum of 1975. But in the 40 years following, as de Gaulle foresaw, Britain's relationship with the European Union, as it became, has been fraught with difficulty. There have been arguments over budget contributions, loss of sovereignty and national identity, free movement of peoples and also the level of immigration, amongst other things. And it all came to a head in that referendum in 2016 where by a fairly narrow majority, the British people voted to leave the EU. Now there's a prospect of the UK becoming once again a more outward-looking global trading nation. It's interesting, you know, when you think about its equal 38, the merchants are traders of Tarshish, that they, all the talk in the UK at the moment is about trade, making new trade deals, being much more outward-looking. And in fact, it was striking how soon after the Brexit vote last year that other nations were declaring an interest in making their own trade deals with the UK, including Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand, the USA, and many others. Now, brothers and sisters, all of this is very encouraging, I think, from a prophetic point of view. In the 1970s, many brethren were taken by surprise when Britain joined the common market and predicted from their understanding of prophecy that at some point she would leave. And the basis of this expectation lies, amongst other things, in the association of Great Britain and the biblical Tarshish. As long ago as 1838, in the Apostolic Advocate, Brother Thomas, even before he'd come to a full knowledge of the truth, described Britain, there as you can see on the screen highlighted, as the Tarshish of modern times. And that was a view he continued to advocate in more detail in the years following. Now here's an extract from his book, Exposition of Daniel, but there's a very similar passage in Elpis Israel as well. He says, as to Tarshish, there were two regions so-called in the geography of the ancients. Jehoshaphat built ships at Ezion Geba, a, point, a, a port of the Red Sea, that they might sail thence to Tarshish. Now it would be seen by the map that they could only sail southward, from which they might then steer east or north for India. The voyage occupied them three years. In the days of Solomon, the trade was shared between Israel and the Tyrians, for he had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. These products point to India, said Brother Thomas, as the eastern Tarshish, a country which has always conferred maritime ascendancy on the power which has possessed its trade and been its carrier to the nations. But then he continues, but there was also a Tarshish to the northwest of Judea. This appears in the case of Jonah, who embarked at Joppa, now Jaffa, on the Mediterranean, to flee into Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. He could only sail toward the west. Like the eastern Tarshish, it was a country, not a city, whose merchants frequented the Tyrian fairs. Addressing Tyre, the prophet says, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches. With silver, iron, tin and lead they traded in thy fairs. These metals are preeminently, he says, the products of Britain. The merchandise of the northern Tarshish and of the eastern identifies Britain in the north and India in the east with the two countries of that name. So that's what Brother Thomas put in Exposition of Daniel, and as I say, there's a very similar passage in Elpis Israel. Now, of course, this identification has not always been accepted by brethren and we accept it's a matter of interpretation. But there are a number of indications that this view is essentially correct, despite Britain's more diminished role in the world since the loss of her empire. So what does the Bible tell us about Tarshish? Well, here's just a selection of passages just to set our minds thinking in the right direction. 
First of all, you start in Genesis chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, where we read that Tarshish was a son of Javan, of the family of Japheth, and he inhabited the Isles of the Gentiles. Tarshish, the Isles of the Gentiles. Then come down to the second bullet point. Psalm 72 makes the same point. It says in connection with the establishment of the kingdom of God, the kings of Tarshish and of the Isles shall bring presents. Then the third bullet point takes you to Jonah. He boarded a ship at Joppa to go to Tarshish. Now just think about that. If he boards a ship at Joppa to go to Tarshish, then he's going to a place, isn't he? Not just a direction. You don't get on a ship to go in a general direction. You get on a ship to go to a place. So the very fact that Jonah did that tells us that Tarshish had to be a place. And as Joppa is in the eastern Mediterranean and Jonah was seeking to travel as far away as possible in the opposite direction to Nineveh because he didn't want to go there, it suggests that the Tarshish to which he was travelling lay far in the west. Then you come to the next bullet point, which is Isaiah 23, which describes Tarshish as being afar off in relation to the land of Israel. Isaiah 23 gives us the burden of Tyre, and it includes the expression, pass ye over to Tarshish. Now, Tyre traded with Tarshish and became associated with it after her fall. And the prophets indicate that in the latter days there will be a counterpart of the Tyre-Tarshish power. And then you come down to the last bullet point there, ships of Tarshish. There are a number of references to ships of Tarshish in Scripture, so that tells us it's a maritime power. Then these next two passages. Ezekiel 27 tells us that Tarshish traded with Tyre. Tyre was the ancient capital of the Phoenicians, who were great sailors and traders in the ancient world. They traded with Tarshish. And the same chapter of Ezekiel tells us what it was they got from Tarshish. Silver, iron, tin and lead. So it was a far off land, a trading nation, where these particular metals could be obtained. Finally, in 2 Chronicles 9, we're told that Solomon and Hiram, king of Tyre, had a navy at Ezion Giva on the Gulf of Aqaba. These ships went to Tarshish on a three-year voyage, returning with gold, silver, ivory, apes and peacocks. Now that navy could either have gone west by finding its way around the African continent and up the West African coast and beyond, or else it could have gone east in the direction of India. Certainly we know that the Phoenicians did reach the West African coast, Spain, Britain and even further afield. But there's more. When you think about this Tarshish language that we just picked up in these passages, just link it with these verses in Isaiah. Isaiah 49 presents the Tarshish power as being sympathetic to the Jews, helping them to return to their land. And it doesn't mention Tarshish, but it's Tarshish language, isn't it? Listen, O Isles. Well, Tarshish is, is the Isles of the Gentiles, it's described, isn't it, in Genesis 10. So it's Tarshish language. Listen, O Isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughter shall be carried upon their shoulders. Or if you get down to the second part of the quotation there from Isaiah 51, the isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arms shall they trust. The redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. So it presents the Tarshish power then as being sympathetic to the Jews who will help them re to return to the land at the right time. So in terms of Bible prophecy then, Tarshish plays a part at the time of the end. And that's why we read Ezekiel 38, because that confirms it for us. Here we have this uh, prophecy about the invasion of the land from this power to the north, and Tarshish is mentioned, isn't it? Let's just, shall we turn back to Ezekiel 38? We know the words in the early part of the chapter. We've just read them. The 
crisis of the time of the end when the land of Israel is invaded. And in that context, we have then the words of verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Now you notice that the, they say to the Gogian host, Art thou come to take a spoil? which would indicate then that they're already in the region. Art thou come to take a spoil? So these powers are already in the region and they're associated at the beginning of verse 13 with Sheba and Dedan. So it's Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. Now Sheba and Dedan, as you can see from the map there, are names that point us to the Gulf region the Gulf states. They're associated here in verse 13 with the merchants of Tarshish. And actually this association, at least to an extent, is already there and it's growing. In November 2016, there was a report that Britain's Royal Navy had opened a new base in the Gulf state of Bahrain, underlining Britain's commitment to the Gulf and Bahrain especially. Cooperation actually between those two countries goes back over 200 years and today there are strong military, diplomatic and trade relations. And to reinforce this point, the following month in December 2016, the British Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson delivered a speech in Bahrain which the Foreign Office itself entitled, Britain is back east of Suez. And he described the policy as building on and intensifying old friendships. So already to an extent, this relationship that's set out here in verse 13 already exists. Now, the prophets of old, of course, are very clear that at the time of the end, the time associated with the return of Christ, a strong army from the north is going to sweep down across the Middle East and occupy the land of Israel. Ezekiel 38 speaks of it as a confederation of powers. And that ties in with Joel's picture of the latter days. He says that one of the features of the time of the end is that nations will arm themselves, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. That is going to allow the weak to say, I am strong. And Ezekiel 38 here identifies a number of smaller powers in league with Gog, and no doubt the weaker ones will think of themselves as being strong in this alliance. Now, Ezekiel suggests, as I'm sure we're all aware, that this confederacy is going to be led by Russia. It's the Rosh there at the beginning of the chapter. It's going to be led by Russia, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal, and it's going to come like a cloud to cover the land. It's going to be an overwhelming force when it invades. And amongst the nations in support are going to be Persia, Ethiopia and Libya. Likewise, Daniel 11 speaks about the latter-day invasion of the Middle East and the land of Israel by a power described as the king of the north. But Ezekiel further indicates that this power is going to be challenged diplomatically and ineffectively by a group of nations who are opposed to the invasion. Those who are more sympathetic to Israel, such as Britain, Australia, the US, Canada, New Zealand and so on, referred to in verse 13 as the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions. Now interestingly enough, as I put there on the screen, Rotherham translates that in in his emphasized Bible as the traders of Tarshish and all her young lions. So it's a description then, if you like, of a Gentile family of lions. And there's another, that's a, a famous World War I cartoon, of course, which makes the point. This is a cartoon that appeared in a Christadelphian publication during the First World War, which again shows the same thing, a Gentile family of lions. And interestingly, the term is used elsewhere in this way. Just come back to Ezekiel 32. Ezekiel 32. And 
which says, verse 2, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations, and thou art as a whale in the sea. So a young lion of the nations is another, another example of the term being used in that way for nations. And that's how it is in Ezekiel 38, verse 13. It's a picture of a Gentile family of lions or nations. It's actually describing a global trading power with interests in the Middle East sympathetic to Israel. But when the invader comes down, these other nations in verse 13 are only able to voice a protest. Art thou come to take a spoil? Which means at the time they're either unwilling or unable to act. Or perhaps they are simply taken by surprise by the speed of the invasion along with Israel herself. I think the language of Ezekiel 38 suggests that that may well be the case. You get expressions like the land of unwalled villages, those that are at rest, that dwell safely. Why then might they be taken by surprise? Well, is it perhaps that President Trump has managed to secure his deal with Moscow? Art thou come to take a spoil? Haven't we got a deal? President Trump has said he wants to do that. You know, during the election campaign, he made a number of well-publicized policy sound bites, including a desire for the US to have a better relationship with Russia. Um, there's an example from one newspaper at the time when the American election was taking place. Commentator said, one candidate spoke about doing a deal with Russia. One candidate called Vladimir Putin a better leader than Barack Obama. But now Donald Trump is on his way to the White House. Will he be able to deliver on his oft-repeated but never clearly elaborated new deal with Russia? Well, I'm sure we're all aware that Moscow welcomed Donald Trump's election victory. President Putin was one of the world's first leaders to congratulate the president-elect on his victory, saying that he hoped to work together for removing Russian-American relations from their crisis state. No doubt, amongst other things, Moscow was hoping for an easing or scrapping of the sanctions that the US and EU imposed following Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, and possibly a more accommodating line with regard to Russia's involvement in the Syrian conflict. However, in practice, there may only be limited room compromise on both sides, because many of the Republican Party behind President Trump are very hawkish when it comes to Russia. And you may well be aware that there's this ongoing investigation into alleged Russian interference in the 2016 US presidential election. That's an investigation, of course, that still has to come to a conclusion. But, you know, despite this, it's very interesting that the indications are that Presidents Trump and Putin continue to get on, on a personal level, very well indeed. Only December the 19th, a matter of days ago, CNN ran a headline, Trump and Putin closer than ever. And this arose from a phone call between the two men the previous Sunday, during which, we're told, Putin thanked Trump for the CIA's, CIA's help in thwarting a terror plot on St. Petersburg, Russia. Four days earlier, the two men had also spoken when President Trump thanked Mr. Putin for positive comments he'd made at a press conference about the US economy. So on that level, they appear to have a very warm relationship, quite a close relationship. Well, we have to watch developments. But it certainly appears that when the invasion takes place, the Tarshish power is not expecting it. Perhaps they think they have a deal. So why is this invasion taking place? You know, it's not difficult, is it, when you think about current events, to see the Ezekiel 38 scenario actually coming to pass. Russia, a major power to the north of Israel, is becoming increasingly confident and aggressive on the international stage. Notwithstanding the harsh economic sanctions imposed on her by the EU, the US and other countries, Moscow has largely been acting as she pleases in the Ukraine and Crimea, and the Baltic states are also said now to feel under threat. 
The United States, on the other hand, still the world's most powerful country after many years of bruising conflict following 9-11, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan, has shown little appetite in recent years for further direct military intervention. And you remember at the same time under the previous US administration, becoming more self-sufficient in energy and less dependent on the, the, the oil-rich Gulf states, the US courted Iran and in the process alienated its traditional supporters in the Middle East, including Israel. The thinking in Washington seems, Washington seems to have been that America and Iran could join against common threats such as ISIL. However, in order to, arrange at the, uh, in order to arrive at the arrangement of nations we've got here in Ezekiel 38, America's policy had to change. And surely the very different notes that are now coming out of the White House from President Trump and the team around him suggest that that change is already taking place. It's much more aggressive and potentially interventionist foreign policy. Now Ezekiel here is very clear on how it's all going to end. Verse 23 of Ezekiel 38. God's name is going to be magnified. He will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that he is the Lord. In a, an edition of the Milestones booklet, published um, back in 1979, I think it was, Brother Graham Pierce made these comments. Now, bear in mind, he was writing all those years ago, and this is what he said about Ezekiel 38, verse 13. The merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions thereof, this brief phrase from Ezekiel 38, indicating that the merchants of Tarshish will be involved in challenging the northern invader of the land of Israel, is suggestive in a number of directions. It tells us, he says, that Britain will not be part of the European Confederacy, that we can look for close cooperation between Britain and America, the strongest of the young lions, that Britain has a part to play in the Middle East, that she will maintain her world trading position, expressed in the words, merchants of Tarshish. There is the hint that she may be closely involved in the prosperity of Israel at the time of the invasion. Now it's remarkable, isn't it? You know, Brother Pierce, Bible in hand, was able to write those words as long ago as 1979. But sometimes people wonder whether really America is one of the young lions. Well, I would suggest that she is. Certainly in origin she is, when you look at where she came from. But also, in recent times, what about this? The United States, we're told, could become an associate member of the Commonwealth. And uh, there was, back in February of this year, an article which said this, the Royal Commonwealth Society is making plans to open a branch in the United States with a view to one day bringing America into the fold as an associate member. The project, which is said to be backed by the Queen, has come about in part as a result of Donald Trump's fondness for Britain and the royal family. It comes amid efforts to develop the Commonwealth as a tool for building relationships on everything from foreign policy to trade. Again, it's building up the importance of the Commonwealth following Britain's exit from the European Union. So, there, back in February, they were making plans to open a branch in the United States. Well, fast forward to September, and what do we find? The Royal Commonwealth Society is establishing a presence in the American state of Mississippi. The historic move is an attempt to build on similarities in language, culture, and trade that already exist between the Commonwealth countries and America. The move has added significance given both Theresa May, the Prime Minister, and Donald Trump, the American President, have signalled their desire for a UK-US trade deal after Brexit. Indeed, one of Mr Trump's close political allies, Phil Bryant, the Governor of Mississippi, has agreed to serve as the branch's chairman of the Board of Governors. So, this idea that was floated earlier this year actually looks as if it has some momentum behind it. And yet, brothers and sisters, at some point, the Tarshish power, along with many other powers, has got to be humbled. 
Now, there are a number of scriptures that speak about this, and I'm just going to put them on the screen now. We'll, we'll have to pass through them quickly because our time has virtually gone. Psalm 48 is talking about the kingdom established. And in that context, it speaks about breaking the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. So there is a humbling of Tarshish. Isaiah chapter 2, which begins with a wonderful vision of the kingdom, it's a chapter that we often quote, takes us through the days of King Uzziah and the earthquake that happened in his time, which, as we know, is a foreshadowing of the earthquake of Zechariah 14, the greater earthquake at the time of the end. And it's in that context we read, the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Upon all the ships of Tarshish there is a judgment, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord, Yahweh alone, shall be exalted in that day day. And then we've got Isaiah chapter 60. Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And that's an interesting passage, because it's speaking about restoration in the kingdom age, when the resources of Tarshish are placed at the disposal of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's some wonderful events set before us, brothers and sisters, as we look at Scripture. Some wonderful things that are prophesied, and we live in exciting times when we can actually see many of the words of the prophets coming to pass before our very eyes. I just want to finish by reminding you of some words that quite often we sing together. We know that we have to remain alert. We have to be watching the signs of the times if we're going to be ready for our Lord's coming. Do you remember those words of Brother Isaac Collier that we sing? We know the end, we know the way, and some with life he will endow. Shall we be with him in that day? We make the answer now.